Advent by candlelight. It's a little different this year, isn't it? But it's so good to see all of your beautiful faces. And I have you on gallery view so I can see all of you at once. But for this program, I'm going to invite you to switch your view. So if you can see everybody now, I want you to go to the top of your screen and click on speaker view. <clears throat> so now you should only see me and a few other faces. And if you have not already done so, please turn your microphone on mute. Some of you have very lovely voices and we're having some very interesting conversations. <laughs> and while we're not in our sanctuary, I want to invite you to create a sacred space where you are. We sent you in your gift bags a candle so please make sure you have yours ready. <clears throat> Excuse me, unless you have some fire magic, you'll need something to light them with as we go on in our service. And this night, even though it's unusual and different than we are used to coming together, it's still about us as women coming together and being a part of this special season in the life of the church. And even in the midst of a world turned upside down, Advent by candlelight is that special time just for us. So I invite you to join each of us from our separate spaces and finding that place of relaxation that place where we in our homes can feel like it's all about us. Because for the next hour or so, it is all about us and God and sharing with our sisters and this special time of worship. So make sure that you have that space just for you. Let the kids know it's not mommy time, it's me time. Let your husbands know, um, have a cracker or a cookie, dinner will be a little late. And let us join together and come together in this time of awe and majesty as we celebrate the expectation, the awe, and the wonder of Advent as we look for the coming of the Christ. And now we will join together in singing. And you can sing as loud as you want, as wonderful as you want, and as off key as you want, because no one can hear you. But we are going to join together in singing our Advent hymn of the evening, which is Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Israel. 
Thank you, Maria. This is beautiful. And now let us prepare for our prayer for the evening. We are here and celebrating Advent by candlelight. Our theme is embracing joy. Our prayer for the evening is also entitled embracing joy. Where you are, Let's prepare ourselves for prayer by putting our feet flat on the floor and our hands in front of us and clasped or just at our knees. But let's make sure that we are focusing on God. Our space as we share together in prayer with our sisters, wherever they are. Most gracious and all-giving God, we come today as women of faith, celebrating your majesty and your love. Even as the world turns upside down, even as things are strange, they remain new, exciting, fresh, and familiar, because it is you who holds our world. We come tonight embracing the joy of this moment as women of faith, as women who know that they are loved by you. Even as things continue to swirl out of control, in some of our lives, even as the world seems to go in directions we don't understand, we still feel your love and the familiarity that comes from your cherished presence and the presence of your spirit. We come with expecting hearts knowing that you continue to love even in the midst of these times. And so while others choose to be bitter, while others choose to be sad, while others choose to look at the downside and the hard times and the sad times, we choose to embrace joy. We embrace the love of your son and the love that you demonstrated by giving your most precious gift to the world. And so in this season in our lives, we pledge to you that we will continue to embrace joy. In Christ's name we pray, amen. And now we will continue our worship by joining together and singing the first two verses of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
Amen. And now it's time to share in scripture together. Our scripture reading for this evening comes from the gospel according to Luke, the seventh, the second chapter, the seventh through the 20th verses. And it reads as follows. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in the bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those who he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place which the Lord has made known to us. So they went in haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed and what, at the, what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. This is God's word for his people. We give thanks to God. Amen. for that beautiful rendition of Absolutely. Away in a Manger, arranged by Mark Hayes. And so now it comes the time in this year's celebration. I know so many of us who have been to and have been by candlelight in the past, this is the highlight of the evening. We have the privilege and the pleasure of having Reverend Faith Fowler with us. Um, as we know, this event 
is a fundraiser for Cass Community Social Services, of which she is the Chief Executive Officer. And the amazing work that they do in the city of Detroit and southeastern Michigan really needs no introduction for any of us who are familiar with Revan Fowler and Cass Community Social Services. So I won't bore us with details and I won't um, extend the accolades beyond the one statement, and that is that she is truly God's work woman in this world. And we thank God for the blessing that she is to our community. So without further ado, we welcome Reverend Faith Fowler. Thank you so much. It is good to be here. Um, yeah, I'm not sure why I'm not the big picture now, huh? <laughs> don't know what's going on. Can you hear me? You are the big picture for us. Or am I? I'm just not in my own screen. I'm just right. Okay. Do I have the ability to share? I uh, I sent David a message, but he didn't respond. Do you know that? I think you should be able to share. Uh, no. Is there some way we can get him to give me the ability to share? David. He has gone out to Dunkin' Donuts. Oh, you should be able to share now. Okay, let me see here. Uh, thank you, David. You're the best. So I'm going to share a couple uh, different things tonight. And um, I, I really appreciate you doing this in the middle of a pandemic. Um, there was every good reason to cancel, and yet... Uh, your evening is what starts my advent really every year it, it just takes me to the right place in terms of my soul and my physical well-being and so i thank you for having it anyway uh, and allowing me to be a part of it i thought i'd begin by talking about four children because uh, the women of franklin are always interested in terms of what's going on with kids and so i thought i'd uh, start by sharing the story of four different children to give you an idea of what we've been up to. The, the first child on your picture there is a little girl, uh, just, just young. I went to the family shelter one afternoon after the schools were closed in Detroit, and she had a look that was even worse than what you see on your screen. She was not happy at all. Um, and so I pulled her aside and asked, you know, what is the problem, little girl? And she explained to me that she was the best in her class, that she was the smartest, she had the best grades. I mean, you know, Val Victorian of second grade, if you will, competitive uh, core uh, uh, in terms of her, you know, DNA, she wanted to um, excel. And the problem was when they closed the schools, we, didn't have Wi-Fi, but it didn't really matter because she didn't have a, a PC or a laptop or even a smartphone. And so, although all the students in Detroit were to learn remotely, as so many other places were in Michigan, she couldn't. And what she was afraid of was that she would slip uh, behind so, so much so that she thought she might even be put a grade behind. And you know, who would think that small children would be worried about such things in the middle of a pandemic, but she was. And we were able through a donor to put up just three computers and to hook them up with a land uh, connection uh, wiring. And she, I don't know, she became a completely different person that day once she realized that she could continue to go to school and so she, my second grader Val Victorian, um, is a story you should remember because it was true for all 50 kids in our shelter, as was true about losing the midday lunch. Uh, and so when you support places like Cash, you make sure that kids don't fall through the cracks, that they have opportunities to, to excel and to achieve and to dream about their future, what they might be. The, the second one is actually a bunch of kids. We, um, uh -oh, there we go. 
we we have this park between the Scott building and uh, the Thomason building. It really was just a trash heap when we got it. But there's a man, a good Presbyterian from Celine, who came in every week for about three years with his tractor. And he cleared out the trash and the dead animals and planted flowers and bushes and trees. And so now it's a quite lovely place. We have swings and slides and horseshoes. And um, this summer we added a band shell. Uh, and so we decided when uh, Chadwick died uh, from Black Panther that we'd have a movie night, sort of like going to camp and invite all the kids, all 50 kids and their parents out into the park at night uh, to in enjoy the Black Panther, right, as a way to, to, to lift up a, a really good movie and a really great actor. And we decided that before the movie, we'd use the fire pit, which is new to the park as well, uh, what I didn't realize or recognize is that these kids haven't been to camp, and so they've never even made a s'more. So we went hunting for sticks, and then we uh, sharpened them with a knife, you know, uh, so much for sanitation and all that good stuff. We, we didn't clean anything off. And then we loaded them up with marshmallows, and they promptly, you know, encircled the pit. And most of them burned the heck out of those marshmallows so they were crisp and, and black. And then they'd run over to grab their uh, graham cracker and, and chocolate, of course, and smoosh them together and eat them promptly. They decided they really liked s'mores. In fact, at least six of the 50 kids ate more than six s'mores apiece. So I'm fairly confident that the next morning they were sick. But after the s'mores, they came to the movie, and as you can see, they were sat, sat in lawn chairs and ate popcorn and drank, you know, lemonade underneath the stars. These kids never go to camp. I'm sure, you know, before that night, they've never even noticed the stars. And, and so when you support us as you do, and some of you have already done this year, you didn't wait for the big event, you set your check in already and thank you. It, it means that our kids get to watch movies outside together with their families and get sick in the morning. So thank you very much. <laughs> the, the third picture is um, a young man who came to us, he was four years old. And um, he's small in, in stature. His, his name is Bink, uh, because that's what his family calls him. And part of the reason he's so tiny is because there was a, a problem when he was born, but it didn't leave him handicapped in the sense that he couldn't walk or run or throw things. And by the way, all of those are descriptive of Bink because he's He's a, a little boy in motion, right? Often I had him by the coat or the hand or over my shoulders like Jesus carrying a lamb to make sure he wasn't getting into mischief. He just, he didn't have any attention span at all. So from the time he was four until the time he was 18, his family and I just prayed that we'd get him through school. Uh, because he just couldn't concentrate, this kid, but he made it. And I remember going to his graduation when he had his cap and gown and his family was there and pictures and selfies and um, feeling so proud of this young man and, and, and believing in his future. He wanted to go to college. The family didn't have a lot of money, so he worked three jobs because he got accepted and enrolled in Schoolcraft College. And two of them were full-time and one of them was part-time and one of the full-time jobs was at CAS. He actually was a security person on the midnight shift of the tiny homes. We're up to 20, by the way, 20 tiny homes done. We'll start another four or five in the spring. And uh, he worked from 12 at night to eight in the morning. And he was good because he was inquisitive and curious. If, if he saw a car out of place, he'd, he'd call it and report it. 
stolen. If he saw somebody stumbling through the snow or seemed to be having health issues, he'd he'd call, you know, 911 and get them help. He he'd notice a door or window open and, and make sure that it was secured. I mean, he was he had eyes in the back of his head, my mother was used to say, you know. He he just saw everything everywhere and he was Johnny on the spot. Well, a year and a half ago, he got off at eight o'clock in the morning after working all night. And um, by 11 o'clock, he was in a, a car crash. And at 25, he died. And everybody was overwhelmed with grief because we had known him his whole life. And he had survived, you know, those hellish years of being a teenager. and. We were so hopeful of the life he was gonna lead, right? And um, his mom works for Cass, his sister used to work for Cass, she's now a Detroit public school teacher. And so we tried to find a way to remember him, not just his premature death, but his, his life. And one of the things, he was a cyclist. He, uh, he rode uh, with the slow rolls on Monday night here in the city, and he rode with three different bike clubs. In fact, one day he was mad at his mother, and he got on his bike and decided, I don't know, I think he was 18, maybe 19 years old. He got on his bike and decided he was going to run away to Chicago. And by the way, he made it all the way to Kalamazoo until his pedal broke, and he had to call his mom to come pick him up. How's that for a, you know, what goes around comes around story? And so I thought, well, well, maybe we'll do a memorial ride uh, in, in memory of William and raise money for the tiny homes that he guarded so, um, so wonderfully. And, and we, they advertise a trail uh, lake to lake, from Lake Michigan to Lake Huron, from South Haven to Port Huron. And people signed up to do different legs with us. And sometimes it was on trails and sometimes just stone and sometimes paved and some, well, it wasn't lake to lake trails. It was lake to dead end trails. So often we were lost, they weren't connected. And so you'd end up out in the street or you'd end up in some cow pasture trying to find your way to the next city. But, but we did it all 275 miles. And one day his sister rode with us and one day his mother drove the scout car with us and we were able to remember such a great life. And um, some, you know, sometimes we lose people far too soon. This year we got another four year old. She, uh, it's a classic story. She, um, her grandmother applied to move into a tiny home and we really weren't set up to, to have kids because none of the homes have bedrooms, but the residents of the tiny homes, they interview the candidates and everybody loved her grandmother. And at the end of the interview, her grandma said, is it okay if I have a child? And of course it wasn't, but they liked her so much. They said, well, there is that one house that has a loft. And so we offered her this house and they both moved in. The grandma who'd been watching this little girl since she was four months old. And I'm telling you, she has changed the neighborhood. Yeah, if you walk down the block, you see chalk drawings on, on the cement and a big sandbox and a little pool in the backyard. And she loves to decorate, you know, uh, Easter, all kinds of bunnies and eggs and lights and Fourth of July and Memorial Day flags and, you know, uh, uh, Halloween, you know, scary things everywhere that she was behind, by the way. And now it's lit up for Christmas. She, she likes to dress up. Her grandma said when I interviewed her, and I just, I'll never forget this if I, I, if I live to be as old as Reverend Patood, um, that 2020 was one of the best years of her life. And all I could think about is the rest of us have been sort of complaining and feeling sorry for ourselves. And here this grandma and a little girl have a home and health and happiness and hope and a future for two generations. And the only way we're able to do that is through people like you who help us all year long, not just at Christmas, but all year long, 
you pray for us and you bring us things and you send us money and you, you partner with us with food. I mean, we notice that. Franklin Church, uh, you, you know, you're a part of our ministry. So I want to sort of give you the four kids to represent the four candles of Advent. And of course, the last candle is the Christ candle that reminds us what it's all about. It's, it's about that miracle of God coming into time and, and reminding us that we're not orphaned, that there's always a reason that the darkness will be dispelled that miracles still happen. So I want to try, if I can make it work, to show you a very short video about what we're calling the miracle on 14th Street. And it really is because of the um, COVID. But you'll understand it as I show it. Hopefully you'll be able to hear it just fine. Oh, keep going. No, no. So 2020 has been a challenge for all of us, and especially at CAST, it's put a light on some of the places our people uh, can be better served. Clearly, the family shelter is one of those places, as we've had 50 people crowded into one room. It's, it's hard. I mean, I'm not going to tell myself. It'll make you cry when your first time coming up in here and you see some of the things going on. It'll literally make you cry. Sometimes it's just like chaos in here. And if a person walks to the door who's never been in a shelter before and they see the bags of clothing along with the people, a lot of times they just turn around and walk out. They'd rather sleep in that car. They'd rather stay on the street where they were, in an abandoned home. I mean, it made me cry. It made me want to run a couple of times. We're almost always overcapacitated simply because there's not a lot of shelters here in the city of Detroit. and There's no other places for the individuals to go. So social distancing here at the shelters have been almost impossible simply because of the way the architecture of the rooms, how many families we have in the rooms, the abundance of people that we've had to take in so that they could be out on the street. If I won the lottery and I could build a shelter for the people, each person would have their own individual room. <laughs> The good thing during the pandemic is that people have stepped up in all kinds of ways to help us solve problems. Indeed, another nonprofit uh, is moving out of a building just a block from our world headquarters, and uh, we've managed to negotiate a deal to, to buy the building and renovate the building, so it'll become our new family shelter. And it'll be wonderful in, in so many ways, including that each family for the first time ever will have their own bedroom. Uh, if the family is just two people, that, that'll be fine. If, if there are as many as 10 people, we have rooms large enough to accommodate them so they can stay together and be safe together. They have a door, which to me always signifies dignity and autonomy and uh, solidarity, uh, but mostly now safety. We were so close together You'd be worried about stepping on somebody or babies waking up in the middle of the night and they tell you to walk out the room, but you can't go nowhere because you're right there in the middle. But if you got a single room, it'll take pressure mentally off the mothers. Having their own space and being able to have whole households, mom and dad or single dad and children in their own rooms with the respect of their own space, how they can treat it. I believe it will be beneficial for uh, everyone. In fact, not only will we be able to house the 50 people we've accommodated thus far, but we'll be able to expand to as many as 70 people at a time in this particular building, including more bathrooms, a sunroom that will convert into a classroom so that the children and students have some place to study that's quiet and bright, an inside playroom for the first time. Imagine having 25 children and no place for them to play inside the house, and a playscape outside. It has a huge dining room and a commercial kitchen. 
the commercial kitchen actually comes with a walk-in refrigerator and a walk-in freezer, so we'll have the opportunity to uh, store up food at discounted prices or, or food that's donated. There's a nice laundry room. There are actually a few bathtubs. We've never had a bathtub before with our family shelter. And as you well know, little children love to be in there with uh, bubbles and ducks and other things. Um, so it'll be nice for young families in particular. One of the nicest features of this building is it comes with a chapel that was set up for the nuns originally with beautiful stained glass and a balcony and a small organ and, and seating that's adjustable so that we can use it as a living room many days. The people can come in here and gather as groups or watch movies or have that sort of activity. Volunteer teams will be able to start their day here with devotions or end their day with communion. And clearly, the residents who want to can come for optional Bible study or worship experiences. So to have this option is a, is a huge gap that we're able to fill because of this facility. We had a family step forward, Dr. Jim and Jacqueline Fox, to help us buy the building. The building will take some work. It was built in the 1920s as a convent. It will take some love and some rehab and some care, and that's why we're coming to you now to see if you'll be a partner in this work that provides a place and a space and a future for families. It's a warm and inviting place because originally it was a convent and so there's terrific tile work and stained glass and woodwork that speaks of home and family in a way our shelter never has until this point. So we're very excited about the opportunity. We know we can't do it alone. We require all kinds of people, individuals and families and foundations and corporations to step up and make this happen. We're calling it a miracle on 14th Street because it really is. If we was able to get all in one room, it would be like a, a remembrance of home. I would take that over anything. Over anything. So I just wanted to show you what we're up to now. And um, it really is because of friends like you helping us help some of the most vulnerable people in metropolitan Detroit. I don't know if you've thought much about being homeless during a pandemic, but not even being able to wash your hands or to have a mask or to have someplace warm to come in. Uh, makes a world of difference when there are organizations like CAS, and we only exist because there are organizations like Franklin. And so we wanted to thank you and ask God to bless you as God has blessed us with another miracle this year. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Fowler. You have once again inspired us with the ministry and work of CAS Community Social Services, with the faces of those in our community who are impacted by your work. We definitely are looking forward to partnering with you in the miracle on 14th Street and are very excited to continue the ministry of our meal kits and our other food donations as a congregation. It is so important, the work that you do. And the little part that we as 
Franklin Community Church play in it. We are so grateful for the opportunity. And as always, we're grateful for the opportunity to share with you this night, this special night of Advent by candlelight. So as we move forward, I want to remind us that tonight is about celebrating Advent. It's about us coming together as women for a special time that's just for us, but it's also about giving. So in your invitation gift bag, you received a letter from Reverend Fowler. You also received an envelope that is addressed to Cass Community Social Services and it should say ABC on the front to let them know that this is a gift from Advent by Candlelight. So if you have not already done so, and I know that many of you have, please put a little something in the envelope. Every little bit helps. Put a stamp on it and send it to Cass. Or we have a specially designated website for this event for giving. So it was in the letter that was tied on the top of your goodie bag for tonight and it tells you the website and if you follow the link to that website you can give your donation there and it will um, instantly be credited to cast it's easy it's simple it's just a walk through your smart device um, and just following the link and the instructions are there once you get there to give your gift after a few weeks, we will let you all know um, how much we have raised through this event. I will tell you, I am so thrilled to look down and see that tonight there have been 90 of us who have come together to share in this special occasion. Just a few shy of how many it would be if we were in person. So. We are so excited to have each of you here with us. Before we move to our closing prayer and our candle lighting service, I want to let you know what will happen after the candle lighting service. And that is, it will be a special time for you to share with each other and what are called breakout rooms. So as we close in prayer, and as we have um, the singing of Silent Night and the lighting of our special Advent by Candlelight candles in our own spaces, you will receive an invitation to join your hostess in a breakout room. And she will have something special prepared for you in the breakout room now. If you were invited to this event and are a guest of myself and Sheila Marshall, you will not get an invitation because we are gonna stay right in this room. So remember, when you get an invitation, just click on it and you'll be magically transported to the table of your hostess, unless you are my and Sheila's guest in which you don't have to do anything. You just get to sit there. But you know, you can sing along and enjoy Silent Night all the way to the end and then we'll start after that. But once again, we want to thank you for your presence and for your continued support of this special evening together, your continued support of the vital work of CAST Community Social Services. And we wanna thank Reverend Fowler for being with us again and for her inspiring words. And thank you, Maria, for our special music. It is a different, but an equally a special night as always. Let us join together in our closing prayer. God, giver of every good and perfect gift, we thank you for all of your blessings, including the miracle on 14th Street, the vital work that CAS Community Social Services does is known by you and blessed by you. We are blessed as well to be participants in that ministry. Blessed with continued growth and strength, even in the midst of a pandemic, 
help us to continue to realize the importance of reaching out to those who have less than they need. Help us to be your voice, your hands, your feet in the world to help bring change and continued hope to those who need it. In Christ's name we pray, amen. And now we will move to our candle lighting service and Maria will play Silent Night. Amen. Go and share your light.